Hi, this is Saxman. I did a panel on FM synthesis back in uh, August 2024, and uh, needless to say, it didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, we started 10 minutes late, had some technical issues, and just ran out of time at the end. Um, I was a little disappointed, but uh, we did film it, and I decided rather than waste that footage, I would just go ahead and release it as is. Because uh, there really is a lot of good content there that I think uh, people could benefit from. So um, we're releasing it now. And uh, basically what it was, I wanted to show the relationships between uh, Yamaha FM synthesizers and a Sega Genesis and other video game platforms. Because those chips are very closely related. I grew up around FM synthesis. I have... Uh, couple FM synthesizers right in front of me. These used to belong to my dad back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, toward the late 90s or early 2000s, he, uh, you know, more or less gave them to me. Not officially, but I've had them ever since. Uh, so uh, one's a DX7-2FD and the other is a TX81Z. Well, the TX81Z is a four operator, eight algorithm synthesizer. That's the one that is very closely tied to these games. I have a long history of working with FM synthesizers, uh, about 25 years roughly. Um, I used to hack Sonic ROMs, and back when nobody really knew anything about them, and one of the areas I did was the music. Long story short, I discovered that the data in the Sonic games was very, very close to, uh, characteristically to what you could do with uh, the TX81Z. And I ended up documenting the format of, of the voice data uh, along with the, the sequence and, and, and different uh, things like that. Uh, but I've been fascinated with them ever since. And I wanted to take that knowledge, uh, do a presentation on how to create FM sounds, uh, you know, sort of the base knowledge that you would need to do that, and then to demonstrate taking an FM sound, a voice from uh, FM synthesizer, put it into a Genesis game, and vice versa. We didn't get to all that. But I hope maybe to do that in the future. So I'm thinking about it. But um, anyway, big thanks to Andy Wolin. We didn't do a ton of editing, but he did do some editing that was probably very vital to, especially to the slides in the, in the footage to make them more visible, easier to, to see. So big thanks to him for, for all of his efforts there. Um, and I guess without further ado, here's what we got. Over. I want to port a TX81Z synthesizer here. 
I want to take the sounds off of this and put it in a Genesis game. And then I want to do the reverse. So, um, so there's really four main things here. Can we just get this from the... Yeah. One thing. So there's really... There's really four uh, main concepts uh, about FM that you really should know. Um, there's these two most basic components, an oscillator and an envelope. So an oscillator is just the thing that produces a tone. Your wall outlet is an AC current. That's what this oscillator is doing. It's just an electrical signal that's pulsating a sine wave. And then you have, on the opposite end, an envelope. And that's simply controlling the volume of any signal you put in. When you combine both of these together, you get what's called an operator. Um, and then an algorithm is the fourth component. That just is a change a bunch of operators together. Okay? So let me let me move into what these operators do. So there's two types of operators, there's a carrier and a modulator. Carrier is what you're hearing. It is plugged to the output of whatever you're playing through. So it's the sound. The modulator is a type of operator that feeds into any other operator. It could be a carrier or it could be a modulator. But it's going to manipulate that signal. And I'll get into that here next slide. So this is, I don't know how well you can see that back there, but this is a modulator here. Modulator is feeding into a carrier wave, and the resulting output is this crazy looking thing with all these little tight waves and then these big bands here. Tight, big band. That's what you're going to hear. And one other way you can sort of think about it too is like with the clock signal and that the modulator is modifying that wave that comes out from the oscillator. So it's like you know, speeding up the clock or slowing the clock down. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So this is the envelope generator. So the envelope is going to, this is just a change of volume. When you strike a piano key, it goes bing, and it sustains there. That's your sustain, that's when it's getting softer. This is the initial hammer coming down, and then it comes down sharply here, and then sustains. When you release the key, the volume go, drops down to zero. Okay? Are you with me so far? Okay, excellent. Only thing I, you really need to know, Yamaha FM chips have, there's a whole variety, of them, but uh, the, the four, the, the ones that have four operators on them, which is a lot of them, which is what you hear in a lot of video games, they have a, a standard set of eight algorithms. And all the algorithm is doing is, is deciding how, the, the, the order, in which the operators are fed. And depending on the order, it can radically change the sound. So, there's really more text here than you really need. There's two, and this is key to everything, there's two main drivers of the modulation. There's the frequency and the output, or the volume of that modulator layer. So the frequency is what he was saying is like a, a what do you call it like a the, the clock signal yeah yeah it's like a clock and you're changing the, basically it's like changing a clock to shift the carrier wave and I'll be able to show you this uh, with a live demo here in a moment so that just shifts the phase of the carrier wave and then the output is just going to 
change the intensity of the modulation. Okay. So here are some examples of how this works. Over there, going up is a change in frequency. So if your frequency down here is 100%, 150, 200. On the other axis, I have modulator volume or output. And that's just increasing, starting at zero, 50, 100. Now, do I have a little more slack here? Hope you all can see this. The, if the modulator has no volume, it's not going to impact the carrier wave at all. What you're seeing here is just a raw carrier signal. When you, in, when you increase, the frequency hasn't been touched, but when you increase the output here, you're getting more waves here, and then you increase it more, you're getting more, even more waves. I want you to notice, though, these two fat bands here, there's one up and one down. There's also one up and one down here. The only thing that changed was the small ones. They, we went from 50% to 100% output. You're doubling the number of smaller waves. The opposite is, is true when you increase the frequency. You have 100%, let's check this one, going up. 100% frequency, one up, one down of the fat waves. When you go to 200%, you have two of these up and two of these down. 150 is, is sort of the, uh, the weird one that has one up, one down, and this one that can't decide what it wants to do. Is that making sense so far? I'm going to be able to show you this in real time. Now, how this works, the modulator, the tech, Really, technically, a modulator is based on hypotenuse, but I like to represent it as amplitude because I think it's easier to understand. When the modulator, say the modulator is 90 degrees out there, in other words, this high point is up here, the carrier wave is down here. So what's going on is the modulator is at its strongest here. As it comes down, this thing, is starting to slow down because the modulator is changing phases. So this, as this signal goes down, this carrier wave is moving slower and slower. And so these bands are getting wider and wider until this hits zero. At which point, this thing stops. And then it starts going the other way. And it's going to increase the ten intensity some more, but it's mirrored. When, it's, when the modulator signal goes negative, it actually starts phasing this in the reverse direction. And I found it now. Now I just got to get my, uh, my program up here. Because that's effectively a multiplication operation, right? So that's why you yes. get to the negative to get the inverse. Yep, that is exactly right. It is doing a multiplication. So I wrote this 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 handy tool. Oh, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years ago. Okay, I'll duplicate. Hey, so awesome, thank you. Okay. So now you see this guy. And I'm going to put, where is it? This one down. Okay. <clears throat> so, ignore this guy. This is two modulators and a carrier. This modulator is broken. This is, these are the only two we care about. I don't know how well you can see back there, but um, I'll just kind of guide you through it. So, when I turn, when I, I can enable and disable the modulator here, uh, F5. So that's all you're seeing there is the carrier. 
when I turn the modulator on, and that's what you see. So let me turn the volume down in the modulator, and then I'm going to re enable it. So eight, now re enable. Okay, modulator's on, but the carrier wave is completely unaffected. Now I'm going to slowly turn up this volume. I want you to notice that little shelf there will reproduce a sound that will come in handy. But as I increase the volume of this modulator, it's pushing out. It's almost like a line that's growing in length, except it's tethered here and tethered there. It's never, that, that part is never going to change. But I can increase the volume and do that craziness. I can also, and let me just do that, and then I want to change, we were changing volume, I want to change the frequency of this. I told you when the frequency changes, you get more of those fat bands there. Whoops, I have to change more of that. Let me zoom in. Uh, sorry, hold on a second. You got to see more of this to understand this. Okay, so that's just the carry wave, it's just kind of squished down. But when I increase the frequency here, let's bring this up to one. Plus one. Now, let's strengthen the volume here. There you go. That's what you're talking about. So you got the one big band and one small. Now let's increase the thing, the, the frequency to two. You notice as I increase this, those bigger bands keep popping up. You've got one here, 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 here. Because really, these are the these are the points in which the phasing shifts. Remember, I told you as the modulator uh, crosses a certain threshold, when it hits zero, the direction of the phasing starts going the other way. That's what's happening here. This is change in direction. And that's because our frequency of our modulator is much higher. And so it's happening more, uh, more it, it's happening more frequently. Uh, let's see. Let me go back to the slides here for a second. Any questions so far? Make sense? Right. I got a question. So, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you're saying frequency, are you talking about the frequency in terms of the tone that it's going to produce, or is it more about the frequency in I'm trying to think of the right terminology? The, the, like, yeah. there, there, are, there, are we talking about two separate frequencies here? One, the perceived musical tone, and one dealing with how the actual waveform is generated, or is it just like one frequency? Rate? Say again? You mean like the sample rate? No, not the sample rate, the actual frequency of the note that our ear is going to perceive as being a musical note. So, uh, actually, uh, well, I can, I can, I don't know if, if this might answer your question. Uh, let me, let me turn this frequency down. This is, the frequent, when I say frequency modulator, I'm talking about the physical Frequency, the right. sine wave frequency itself. Okay. So, so that will affect the musical tone, or like the, the musical note that we hear. For some values of musical note. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the more stretched out the waveform is, the lower frequency you're going, the lower tone you're going to hear. Right. Yeah. 
it gives you, it does give you sort of a perceived increase in the in the pitch, the I guess you could pitch, say, I right? Say. Yeah. So, um, are you adjusting the modulator frequency right now? Yes. Okay. This is the modulator. Oh, but, well, that was horribly out too. But if I uh, bump that up a little bit, it would be a perfect pitch. Let's see. Get it zero. Ah, right there. That is a perfect pitch. It's perfectly the same. Your own PC speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or kind of gives you an idea. Yeah. Is that just pure software right now or do you have a thing? That's software. Yeah, that's, that's something I wrote uh, many years ago. Uh, I just dug it out for this uh, presentation. That's actually uh, mimicking the uh, exact behavior of the TXA1Z, which I have over this laptop here. That's why I saw that I was wondering like Yeah, I'm sure. Or if you were actually like honestly this context. Right, yeah. So if you were to set those same parameters on the X7, it would, it would generate that same code. Yeah. Um yes. Yes. Would you be just using microphone to draw that same sign that it's sent for me? I'm sure. Are you using the other software? Say that again? I didn't catch it. Like if you were using the real one essentially, and you had to catch it to a speaker, you'd still be able to draw the same sign that it's got those values and do it up in the recording software, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you should be able to. Um, so I don't. I asked myself, well, if you want to dive into all this history, I don't want to decide it was too much, but I do want to just highlight sort of the origins of this uh, synthesis here. So that, that is uh, Yamaha's very first FM synthesizer. That's the GS1 uh, released in 1981. It was prohibitively expensive. And, uh, and so there's not a lot of them out there. But in 1983, they got this uh, DX7 alongside the DX1 and DX5. Uh, but it's DX7 that was uh, really, that was the first affordable FM synthesizer. And uh, I'm sure anyone who's read anything on FM synthesis knows that that thing was a monster back in the 80s. Um, Yamaha produced a lot of FM chips, lots and lots of them, uh, many different classes, uh, like the OPL, they call it operator type L. I don't know where you get the, the letters, but OPL chips were used in uh, some sound cards, so Sound Blaster had uh, one of the OPL chips. Uh, the Mark III, Sega Mark III in, in Japan. Uh, I don't know if it came with an FM chip or if it was an add-on, but... but uh, yeah, there was an add-on in the SC 2000. Okay, that's what I mean. Uh, the OPN family, there's OPN, OPN 2, <laughs> OPN A, OPN B, OPN 2 L, all, OPN 3, I can't even tell you everything about all of them, but the OPM2 is from the Sega Genesis. And that's what we're going to use today. Um, just briefly, uh, you know, the OPM is probably the most famous one because uh, a million arcade games used it along with uh, certain uh, computers. And then Yamaha's own FM synthesizers. Uh, the ones that are four operator based uh, tended to use the OPP or OPZ or even OPZ2. Um, the OPZ was uh, sort of an upgrade. Well, the OPP is actually the OPM with uh, expanded uh, test register, but otherwise it's the same. But the OPP, OPZ, uh, added uh, some extra functions. So you could uh, select different types of waveforms other than sine, so you do uh, sawtooth, the triangle, all, all that stuff. 
Uh, and then OPZ, oh yeah, and then fixed frequencies. So for like sound effects, if you wanted to just set the uh, operator to an exact frequency. And then OPZ2 just modif modifies the range of those frequencies. Uh, so there's, obviously you can see a whole line of Yamaha synthesizers that use these, it's just a bunch of them. Uh, the TX81Z here actually uses the OPZ. That's where it gets its name. Uh, oh, this is too much. That's just <laughs> a bunch of chips. Twice the part models, you can't hear um, oh yeah, okay, uh, you know, if you have a phone, if you care, there's just some links I thought was uh, useful to have uh, if you want to learn more, um, but. Are you going to post these slides? Yes, yes, I will make these available. Um, and I guess there will be video too, won't there, Andy? Yeah. Um, let me, because I got this, this box going down here, I want to try to create a voice in the time we have, if I can do it. Have you just run with trackers like Furnace at all? Is this sort of setting up the sounds a similar in that environment, if you know? Uh, trackers, yeah, you can, uh, well, I shouldn't jump the gun. Uh, certainly, I know trackers can uh, sequence the notes. I don't know if they get too much into actually constructing the sounds or not. I don't know. I know you can import a lot of them. Uh, oh, you can't see my thing. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me let me close this. Does that? Okay. Good. Now you can see this. So, what I want to do, and since we're tight on time, I have a cheat sheet to get me through this, so I can demonstrate why some of those things I mentioned were important, particularly the frequency and output. So, I want to replicate a piano. And to do that, you be able to see what the heck I'm doing here. So, in OPS. Okay. Um, that's probably I hope. How do you focus with this? With this, you know, with this? Yeah. yeah, there you go. I can do a little bit of camera. <laughs> yeah, uh, very helpful. Thank you. All right, uh, so. I want to start with a blank slate here. So I'm going to move over to something completely blank. Get it voice. I think that's a blank slate. So, um, first we have, we're going to go, so this is the algorithm. Oh, yeah, you got a little to this. Nope, up here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I don't care about buttons. Okay, <laughs> they can see that. Um, so that's your algorithm. So um, I'm fine with, with one. I remember what one is. One thing that kind of helped me think of algorithms is sort of like imagine you have a preset way that you can chain together the GPU shaders. You know, you've got a certain number of shaders and you can combine them in different different ways. So all this algorithm is doing, one is just the sound, that, that's the carrier wave. And then you have three modulators chained together in sequence. So you always want to start with just a carrier and a modulator. And then you get more sophisticated from there. 
So let's go to the next parameter, feedback zero. You know, we don't want to do any of that. LFO, I'm going to turn that thing off back down because we don't need that. We'll get rid of that. Nobody cares about that. What is that even in? The blank slate. Uh, sensitivity. Okay, just making sure these are down. Okay, edit frequency. So we can set the frequency of each operator here. So, <clears throat> course frequency. So, this is a, these are ratios basically. This is a one. And then our modulator. So, this is operator one. When I go over here, we have operator two. So I want, I'm fine with them being the same. And those values can only go from negative one to positive one, correct? Or can you actually exceed? Uh, no, they, they uh, the, so these are actually based on, on one. Uh, you're thinking of the, the volume. Yes. Uh, let me show you a picture of what I'm actually doing here. So this is a piano. This is a real piano. Notice the structure here. Goes up, crosses this threshold, comes down. But when I talked about the shelf earlier, how it kind of went up here like this, and then level off before it dipped down again. You kind of see that same thing here. Because this is real tight here, but it ends up crossing over here. So that's one thing that I noticed when I looked at this. The other thing is, remember how when you change the number of, uh, the, the frequency of the modulator, you get those big, the big number of big humps there changes. If you can think of this as a sine wave with a bunch of little humps on it, this is like one, two, uh, sort of three, four, five, six, seven, it's hard to kind of get it exact, but that's an approximation. Say seven small, uh, Seven humps you can really visually see there. So, what I'm explaining to you is that can be your modulators. So, if I take, if operator two, which is our modulator, let's use algorithm three. I'm using algorithm three here. Let's go back to OBS so you can see what the heck I'm doing here. There's a focus. Perfect. So I'm switching to algorithm three. This is going to be easier. So one, one, two, three. Now I want to go over. Oh, you're going to need to go back for this. Because I also want to show them an oscilloscope here. Yes. You don't have to close the Oh, I can. Uh, where, where OBS? Okay. So, yeah, okay, so off. I can still do that. Yeah, if you right click the projector thing, just do the I. Bring it up again. Let's use Alt Tab. Alt Tab. Just choose OBS. You know, just make that. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, Thank you. Just use Alt Tab. Whether you're not worried about closing it over there. You're at two fifty right now. Okay. Oh, two fifty. Dang on. Um, okay, so let's uh, get this one here. Mm. Oh, this needs to be on. Do we have a signal? Perfect. Thank you. So we can see what we're doing here. Now I want to increase frequency to match. 
this thing here. So we're going to do frequency of one. So I guess kind of what they used to do to try to simulate real instruments is they probably recorded the actual instrument playing the sound, looked at the shape of the wave, waveform, right? Yeah. And then they thought of like, okay, what algorithms and op, you know, how can I combine the modulators and the operators together to as, as, get as close as I can mm -hmm. to, to that, that shape of the waveform. That's what I was asking really if we can get the software. More commonly, they would use a spectrogram, so they'd see the, the harmonics from that instrument, and they try to make the harmonics line up reasonably well Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you you can use a spectrogram. Yeah, it's pretty hard for humans to interpret complex waveforms, but spectrograms. You, know, you take the first three or four harmonics and you get them good. So it, here we go. So I'm going to increase the modulator. Switch over to. Um, that's easy one. Yeah. So. I want to get seven of those waves. So let's. The job title of someone doing that, like sound engineer? Mm -hmm. Sound designer. Sound yes. designer. Yeah. Yeah. It's really not the actual name. Like it's not composer, right? It's like right. 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 I know that some composers, like such as Howard Dross and Sega, he never actually did any FM programming. I don't think that like he would use the Gem Sound Driver and then just you know feed his music into that. So I mean, oh, geez. you know, it's <laughs> quality may vary, but it's made it a little bit more approachable for musicians. It goes the other way too, right? Like use use a Bashiro famously, like he would just get into that. It's an idiot I think you would like dive into the to the design as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's musicians who did that too. Yeah. So, yeah. See that? See that little shelf there? That's what we want. You go back here. Do that thing. There we go. Yeah. 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 At a volume of 61, I get that little shelf. And the frequency is exactly the same. So now I want to set up the frequency of the third operator, and we want those little humps that I set that I pointed to. So operator three, there were seven humps as I counted. So I want to make the frequency a multiple of seven. And now, when I go over here, and I'm going to be increasing the volume of this, but yeah, I can hear the piano a little bit. Clicking <laughs> <laughs> dirty piano. Yeah. And then we can get an op, um, envelope generator on these to shape the volume. So, how much time we got? Oh, 55. Oh, okay. Yeah, we probably don't have enough time to do envelopes. Okay. But what you would probably do is, like, for the, velo for the velocity of the note, you would increase or adjust the envelope so, like, the faster the velocity. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I didn't have enough time to port the voices. But we're at the headcanon booth. I'd be more than happy to show you all how it's done. I can do it right there. I'm sorry I didn't have enough time to do it here. We just got started too late but, and technical problems. But um, are there any questions while you have me up here? Sure. Uh, I you have a sort of question for us. Like, what if, I'm looking at you. You know, you're, you're creating the waves. I assume all those yes. should basically create these waves and make these tones. Right. So then, you know, when I fire up my, my Sega Genesis 2 with the 2612 or whatever, and the Genesis 1 with the 38, whatever the name of the chip is, they just have a slightly different sound. Like, 
They actually, uh, a lot of the tones will sound exactly the same. Uh, what's different, like the TX81Z, uh, the OPZ chip, has a lot of additional parameters. Um, the, uh, I can't think of what they are right off the top of my head, but there's a bunch, bunch of uh, additional parameters that they have. But they both have four operators, the same eight algorithms, uh, you can tune the frequencies the same. Uh, the frequency range on the uh, TXA1Z is greater, so it's a little more granular. Uh, has uh, several LFOs, whereas the Genesis just has one LFO. Uh, LFO, you know, it's a low frequency oscillator, so it kind of manipulate, oscillates the entire sound as opposed to a single operator. Uh, but a lot of the sounds will sound identical. That's what I was hoping that I had enough time to show you, that I could take this, put it into a Genesis game, and you'd hear the exact same thing. And I can take any sound from any Genesis game and move it over here, and there's almost a guarantee that it's going to sound exactly the same. In fact, one of these over here, I have a couple of these loaded here. Oh, there we go. I don't know what some of them are. I think that's the bass in Sonic 3. The launch bass. Oh, that's what you said. some voice porting, I'd be more than happy to do it for anybody who wants to come over to the Headgan booth. Uh, also, we have two panels tomorrow, I want to say. Uh, we have the Doom World Building at 1 o'clock, and we have the Headcanon panel at 2? Yeah, so the 1 o'clock panel yeah. is going to be right here in this room, and it's going to be covering the basics of getting, it's like a crash course on building levels for Doom. We've never done that before, getting started. And then over in the other panel room, right after that one, Headcan's doing theirs at 2 o'clock. All right. I hope you all will come by. But if not, uh, thank you all for coming out. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes.